Yep. All right, thank you. All right, welcome everybody to the Advanced DAX webinar by Pragmatic Works. My name is Mitchell Pearson, and I will be kind of walking you through this presentation today. I know that when we talk about advanced DAX, that's kind of an anomaly, or it's kind of ironic. And I say that because I get the opportunity to teach DAX many times during kind of our Power BI boot camps. And a lot of the people that I teach DAX to have never even heard of the DAX expression language before. And by the end of that day, or really by the end of a few hours, they're able to do a lot with DAX. They're able to work with a a lot of basic functions, they're able to build calculated tables, they're able to build calculated measures, and they're able to really start adding a lot of analytical value to their data models within a very short amount of time. So for a lot of people, when we say advanced DAX, they're like, well, how complicated can it really be? It was so easy to learn when I really first started that it's, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But hopefully, some of you have already ran into some of the complications that come with really going from an introduction level of DAX to more of an advanced knowledge of DAX. And that's kind of what we're going to introduce today. We're going to get a little bit out of those base, base calculations and start talking a little bit more in depth about filter context. Now, I saw that about 50% of the people on here said they're already familiar with filter context. About 50% said they were not. However, probably everybody is because if you've built a basic measure in Power BI or even if you've done some stuff in pivot tables in Excel, then you're familiar with filter context, even if you're not familiar with it. And that'll make sense here in a little bit. Uh, I've got my contact information on the screen. I blog at mitchellpearson.com. You can reach me by email at mpearson at pragmaticworks.com. You can also follow me on Twitter. It's a very easy way to find out if I'm doing any future presentations. I usually do, I don't know, a webinar probably every other month or at least one a quarter. So I'll usually tweet that out. If you want to know about that, just follow me on Twitter. And then, of course, I have my LinkedIn profile up there as well. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, feel free to do that. All right, so real quick, just a little bit of information about me. My uh, name, of course, is Mitchell Pearson. I'm a business intelligence consultant and trainer for Pragmatic Works. In the last six months, I've really transitioned myself more into a kind of full-time trainer role. Not sure if that's going to be a temporary or a full-time engagement, but that's more specific to our training platform and really trying to build that out and build out the number of courses that we have available. I've been with Pragmatic Works for almost five years now, so a little over four and a half years I've been with Pragmatic Works. I love working here. I hope to be here for many, many more years. I blog, of course, at MitchellPearson.com. All right. So for the agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about working with variables in DAX. And I'm not going to get too complex there. To really see the true value of variables in DAX, we would have to get into row context and nested row context and how variables really simplify that, but that's a little bit bit more advanced than what we're going to get into today. But I will show you how to use variables, how to declare them, and really how to make your code a little bit more readable. We're then going to get into calculate, talking about the calculate function, which is by far the most complex and most rewarding function that you have available in DAX. And we're going to talk about the filter context, of course, and how we can use calculate to kind of change or add to, essentially add to an existing filter context. And then we're also going to talk about the filter function and the all function, two very powerful functions that you have. And uh, there's a lot of use cases for them when you start to author those more advanced DAX calculations. All right, so before we proceed any further, I want to kind of review a couple different resources that are out there. The first resource that I ever looked at in regards to DAX was the Power BI book, the Power Pivot book that was written by Rob Coley. Now, the one that I have on the screen here is his latest and greatest version of that book, but I haven't read that one, but I still do have his original book that I've read many, many times. I really love the way he writes his book, the way he goes through the examples. It's phenomenal. He does a really good job of keeping it very, very simple while you're learning at the same time. Now, you're only going to get to a certain level with that book. It doesn't go, you know, super deep dive, but you can absolutely learn a lot from that book. The other book that I have that I really like is The Definitive Guide to DAX, and this one's by Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari. And this book here is very, very complex. It's, it's I think, 600 plus pages. It's very, very difficult to read, and you'll know what I mean if you've ever read through that book. You, you definitely can get pretty, pretty confused with it. But if you want to become really advanced at DAX and you're going to be doing a lot of complex calculations, then that's a book that you really want to get. And then the other thing, the other kind of visual that I have up here on the slide is a picture of our on-demand training here at Pragmatic Works. 
So I think we've built that out now to about 30 classes and we're adding new classes. And one of the classes that we currently have is an introduction to DAX course. And in the next couple of months, we're going to be reduced, uh, actually introducing and releasing an advanced DAX course as well. And that's the way I like to learn. I'm a visual person. I kind of get lost in the words when I'm reading a book. I like to see examples and I like to see somebody walking me through examples and, and showing it to me. So I really enjoy any time I can get a, a, a class that's been designed and dedicated specifically to what I'm trying to learn. All right. So why advanced DAX? And this goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning when I said that it doesn't make a lot of sense when you say advanced DAX, especially to people that are new. They, they've built some data models out. They've done a lot of really cool calculations and they're like, well, why, why would there be an advanced DAX? And we're not talking about just advanced functions here. We're talking about actually getting in and understanding the context of how your measures interact with diff different filters that are put on a report. So I've kind of listed this as the multiple phases of DAX, and there's a few different phases here. I, I was actually watching a webinar, uh, I don't know, in the last couple of weeks here, and it was by the one of the virtual past chapters. I think it was the business intelligence past chapter. And the guy who gave the webinar was SQL Gene. It was S-Q-L-G-E-N-E, -E, and he has a blog, and he did a really good job, and it was an advanced DAX webinar. And I liked the way that he actually talked about learning, <clears throat> excuse me, about learning DAX. And what he did is, he said that there was this kind of S curve to learning DAX, and I agree with him 100%. What happens is when you first learn DAX, kind of right here on the bottom, and there's not a lot of work that you have to put in before you know a lot of DAX. You're already building a lot of scalar functions. You're already building a lot of calculated measures and calculated columns, and you're building out that analytical value. But what happens is somewhere right around here with calculated measures, you kind of hit a wall. And in order to, to understand everything that's going on and, and build the more complex calculations there, you have to go through this really difficult phase here of learning kind of what's going on internally with DAX, with all the different contexts that you're trying to navigate through. And I really liked his visual and the way that he showed this. And up here at the top, he had evaluation context and row context and iterator functions. All of that is up here at the top. And once you understand context, both at the filter level and the row level and your explicit context that you're overriding these calculations with, that's when you get to your level of understanding is higher up here on the top. And then you can continue your learning and really start authoring some of those more advanced calculations. So the phases of DAX here that I have is really the first phase is this excitement phase or this joy phase. It's when you first learn DAX, you realize it's very similar to Excel. The, the formulas and the functions that you're writing are very similar to Excel. And within a short amount of time, you can add a lot of analytical value to your data models. So you take a data model, you really improve on that, and all of a sudden you're releasing this into production and people are looking at it and they're like, oh, this works great. I love the way these measures are working. And then the next phase is really this, when you start to hit the bottom of that, that curve there and you start to get a little bit confused because you go to build a more complex calculation and you start to realize, wait a minute, this is not working the way I thought it should. And you start to realize there's something going on with the filter context. You can ignore filter context. You can override filter context. Or the existing filter context that happens by default is causing it so that you can't build those calculations you're trying to build. And you start to ask yourself, why do measures work this way? And then, if you're like me, you go through a kind of an anger phase because you didn't learn it as fast as you could. You couldn't find enough information on it. And not only are you confused, now you're utterly confused because when you went to just understand filter context, somebody started talking about row and nested rows and iterator functions and all of these other concepts. And it just made you more confused than you were originally. And this, this is why there's that steep kind of climb on that S-curve that I was showing you a moment ago. All right, and then finally, finally, you get to a point here where you really start to understand DAX, all right? And this is when you get more into the 400 level of DAX and you really understand what you're doing. You understand how to think in DAX and how to author those, those DAX calculations that you're building. So you start to understand it. You know you're not necessarily an expert yet, but you understand how to think through those different problems because you've had enough experience with it and you really start to understand DAX. So those are the multiple phases of DAX. And probably most of you are kind of in that first or second phase where it's starting to get a little bit confusing for you and that's why you jumped on this webinar today. So what we're going to do now is let's transition into the demos and the first thing I'm going to talk about is working with variables. Variables were introduced kind of in SQL Server 2016 so the tabular model of 2016 is when it was re re released and it was also released 
used in Power BI Desktop. Now, all the demos I'll be doing today are going to be in Power BI Desktop, but they easily translate over to Tabular if that's what you're working with. So what is a variable and why do we use variables? If you've used variables in any programming language, essentially a variable is nothing more than a placeholder. All right, it holds the place of a value that you're going to pass in at a later time. So it's just a placeholder. The reason we use variables is because it makes our code reusable. All right, it makes it so that we build a variable and then we can reuse that variable multiple times inside of our, our code that we're, we're kind of building or writing out. Another huge benefit of variables is it makes it easier to write and maintain our code. So we write the code, it makes it easier to write it, to understand exactly what's going on, and then to maintain that code over time. Of course, it means that it's going to make it easier to read, right? If, we can, if it's easier to understand, that means it's easier to read. And then there's also some performance implications of variables as well, especially if I'm writing a variable and then I use that same variable in that DAX calculation multiple times, then I'm only, I'm only having to actually calculate that value one time, right? And then I'm able to reuse it. So there's some performance implications to this as well. Now, once again, I'm going to show you kind of the default behavior of variables, how to use them, how to author them and put them in your DAX calculations. But there's definitely going to be some more advanced applications of variables that I'm going to get into today. Now, maybe in my next webinar here uh, next month, I haven't signed up for one yet, or the month after that, I'm going to get into row context and nested row context and how variables really simplify um, navigating those different contexts that are created when you're working with iterator functions. It was something I wanted to add into the webinar today, but I was like, uh, I think I might confuse people more than I would help them. So I, I scaled that back a little bit and stuck with just the demos that I'm going to do today. So here's the basic syntax for your, your variables here, all right? You have your variable name, so you have var. What var does is it's a keyword that introduces the definition of the variable. And so that's the name of the variable and then the expression that defines the variable value. And then we have the return keyword, and that is essentially the expression that we want to return. So after the return, we can use these variables in our expression that we're building and that we're authoring. There's a couple different places where we can use these variables. So we can use them anywhere a scalar value is expected, also any place where a table value is, expect, uh, is expected. So when you build out these variables, they can store scalar values or table expressions. All right, Either one of those can be acceptable, and then you can reuse those in your DAX calculations further down the line. All right, so we're going to do a quick little demo here of working with variables and where I got this example is I had another consultant who kind of called me up real quick and said hey what I'm trying to do let me get rid of the date here in this demo here what I'm trying to do here let's see if I can get rid of that I'm gonna bring the month in real quick let's bring in the month and then I'm not sure why this is smaller I had all this set up there we go and what we're trying to do or what he was trying to do is he was trying to essentially say, look, if I have, let me get 2007 and 2008. Let's get rid of, okay, that'll work fine. All right, so let's sort this one more time here. And I wanna make sure it's easy to explain what I'm trying to do. So I have a table here and the table has total sales and it has year to date sales. And then I have forecasted year to date sales, something that was kind of created by our marketing team, our forecast team here that says, this is what we forecast your year to date sales is going to be. And if I go all the way down to the bottom here and I go to June, you'll notice that for June, um, if I bring in the day, so this is what I was trying to do there a moment ago, if I bring in the date for June, I'm going to add that to our table. So let me add that to the table real quick to kind of visualize exactly what we're trying to do here. And if we go all the way down to the very bottom of this table, what you'll see is that the month of June is not complete. So when I'm looking at the month of June, I only have sales up in until June 20th. So we're currently selling data, pretend for a moment that this is June 20th of 2008. And if I don't have sales for the entire month, so I don't have sales for the entire month of June or whatever month I'm currently in, then I don't want to actually display the year to date sales. I want to display the forecasted sales. However, if I do have sales for the entire month, then go ahead and display the year to date sales. So the situation here is I want to show either my forecasted year to date or my year to date and the way that I determine that is based on if I have sales for the entire month or not all right so that's what we're looking at if I have sales for the entire month use year to date sales if I don't then use the forecast sales so let me get rid of the date because we don't need that here 
And so the way that I can do that is I have two measures currently created. I have a year-to-date sales measure and I have a forecast year-to-date sales measure. The forecast year-to-date sales measure is a very simple measure. All it is is the prior year-to-date sales times 10%, or I think it's actually 200% times two or three or something like that. But it's a very simple calculation that I'm just using previous data to determine the forecast for the next year. And what I want to do here is I want to, instead of displaying year-to-date or forecast year-to-date, is I want to display one or the other based on the current month that I'm in. And we're going to do that by creating a new calculation. All right, so let me go back up here to my calculation table. And in my measures table here, what I want to do is create a new measure. So on my modeling tab, I'm going to create a new measure. And I want to simplify this. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to say, all right, look, if I'm looking at my, my sales table, and the last day that exists in my sales table is not equal to the last day that exists in my date table, then use the forecast data. If it is equal, meaning that I do have sales through the end of the month, then use the year-to-date sales. An easy way to, to, to really format this so it's easily readable and I can understand what I'm doing is to declare variables, right? So I'm gonna declare my first variable here and then I'm gonna call this variable, let's call it the last sale date. So it's the last date that I have a sale and then I'm going to bring in and use the last date function. The last date function returns the last non-blank date, all right? And then I am going to return from my internet sales table the order date. So this is going to return the very last date that I had a sell in my internet sales table. And then the cool thing about this is you can define multiple variables here by simply adding that, that var keyword again. So this one is going to be the last date that exists in my date table. So let's call this one the last day of month. So what is the last day of month? Same exact calculation here. I'm gonna use that last date again. And then from my date table, I wanna return the last date from the current date that I'm looking at. Now this goes back to filter context. Let's, let's take one step back real quick. If I'm looking at 2007 for February, and I say return the last date for 2007 of February, the last date of 2007 February is going to be February 28th, 2007, right? If I'm looking at March, the last date is going to be March 31st, 2007. So these, all these calculations, just like any other measure, they automatically work within the normal filter context. And maybe I won't take a step back and just make sure everybody understands that. I assume you do, but that's probably a bad assumption on my part. All right, so let's do this. I'm going to say return. Remember, we need that keyword there. And then I'm going to just do basic condition logic. I'm going to say, all right, if the last sale date, let's bring in my variable that we created here. So if the last sell date is not equal to the last day of month, then I put a comma there, then I want to return the forecasted sales measure. However, if it is equal to the last day of the month, then go ahead and return your year-to-date sales. So then we close that up and then let's go ahead and format that measure real quick to be currency English United States and then hit enter, and now I have my dynamic measure. Let me give that a new name. I wanna call that dynamic measure. So it's dynamic because it's determining which value to display based on the, the current month and whether the month is complete or not. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna take a step back real quick. If I get rid of month, and then I get rid of, let's say, year-to-date sales, and then forecasted sales, Notice that well, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at total sales, right? And the original value here was 18 million. And when you brought in the year, when I added year to this table, it took that value in that column right there and it automatically filtered it down to whatever exists on the rows. And it automatically filters it down to whatever exists on the columns. And we're gonna come back and talk about filter context in the next slide here. And as you add additional values to your rows and your columns, it further filters down those calculated measures that you've created. So if I come in here and say, I wanna add in the month real quick, I can add the month into this table and it filters them down. So for 2007, I'm not seeing the total for 2007, I'm seeing the total for 2007 for the month of January. All right, and then I wanna bring in real quick, year-to-date sales. So I'm gonna bring in year-to-date sales and then I'm gonna bring in forecasted year-to-date sales and then I'm going to bring in my dynamic measure that we just created here. And then we're gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom here and take a look at what's going on. So notice, see if we can zoom out just a little bit. Notice that on January, my dynamic measure 
was deriving the value from year-to-date sales. And if you go down the list, it's doing the same thing for February and March and April and May because we've already completed all of those months. We sold data on every day of each of those months. When you get to June, notice that the dynamic measure is, well, it's taking it actually from the wrong one there, isn't it? Let's see what's going on here. So that's June of 2008. That's definitely not correct. Let me take a look at the dynamic measure again. If last date is not equal to last day of the month, oh, okay. So the problem, the reason this is not working is because I actually had to create a separate table. So the internet sales table itself actually does have day, data all the way to June 30th or June 31st. But I had to create a filter table from that. There we go. And the filter table, I filtered it down so it didn't have data until the last day. So I just had to simulate a scenario where this would work since I was working with older sample data. Now, let me close that back up again. And then let's go take a look at our dynamic measure. And now it'll work. It's all the way down. All right. Now you'll see that on May of 2008, it's deriving its value from year-to-date sales. However, when we get to June, because June ends on June 20th, it's now deriving the value from my forecast year-to-date sales. So it's a dynamic measure based on the sales. And this is not, don't worry about the scenario itself. Just, just think through how it's a lot easier to read this code now. If we go back and look at this measure that we created, and we zoom into this, it's a lot easier to understand what's going on because in the very first variable you say, okay, I understand that this is getting the last date for the current month, wherever I'm at inside of my table. This is getting the last date for the date table. Then I'm simply comparing them, and if they don't equal, in other words, if I don't have sales on the very last date of the month, then use forecast, else use year-to-date sales. All right, so that's one scenario there. Uh, I'm going to walk through filter context real quick and go a little bit more in detail than we did there in that section. And we're going to talk about calculate in this section. We're going to talk about filter. And we're also going to talk about the all function. So filter context. The filter context is anything that you apply to your, your rows, your columns, your slicers and filters. Remember, a slicer is a visual filter. A filter is just a filter that's on the report. You don't see it, but it's and then we also have another concept here, which is DAX formula filters. And these are explicit filters that you add to a calculation when you create them. So in this example right here, I have a slicer that filters it down to 2009. I have another slicer that filters down the product brand to Contoso and Proswear. And then on the rows, you have an additional filter here. And on the rows, the filter is on whatever the product is. So the sales amount for my filter context here is essentially going to filter down the internet sales table or whatever that table is, and it's going to return the sales amount for those rows that meet all of those filters that have been applied. So where the year equals 2009, where the product brand is equal to Contoso and Proswear, and where the product subcategory is equal to air conditioners. All right, And then that happens for every single one of these products all, all the way down. So that is the filter context, and that happens automatically by default uh, whenever you build a calculated measure in DAX, which is really cool. That's what people love about DAX is how dynamic it is. However, when you get into more complex calculations, you need to figure out how to override that or remove that filter so you can do things like we're going to talk about here now. So if you've never heard of the calculate function, the calculate function is by far the most complex, but also the, more, the most powerful function that you have in the DAX language. It's the only function that you have in DAX that allows you to actually change and override a filter context, to actually change the filter context. And what it does is it allows you to apply a filter to an existing expression. So inside of your calculated measure that you've created, you can apply a filter to that. And a lot of a lot of times where you're going to use these are going to be to do things like ratios and percent of totals, but that is a very small example there of what you can use Calculate for. When you start building more advanced calculations, you're going to be using Calculate in almost all of those. The syntax is very simple. All right, You start with the Calculate function, you then have an expression, and then you have optional parameters that allow you to apply your own filter. Those are optional. When you get into a little bit more advanced scenarios, you'll see why that is. In our scenarios, we will be adding those optional parameters. The expression there at the beginning is typically going to be an aggregate. So it's going to be something like total sales or total transactions or average or something along those lines. So it's an aggregate or an, just an expression that you're doing, and you're overriding the filters on that expression. And then, of course, what we're saying here is that Calculate can add to or override an existing filter context. 
All right, and at the bottom here, we just have a couple different examples of how that looks inside of a formula. The other expression I wanted to show you real quick here is the all expression. The all expression is um, kind of an enigma. It's really interesting. What it does is it allows you to return all the rows in a table or all the values in a column, ignoring any filters that might have been applied. And this is a function that you're going to use a lot in DAX when you start building more complex DAX calculations because you need to ignore the current filter so that you can return the entire table and perform the calculation that you're trying to perform. And I'll go through a couple examples here when we get into DAX here in just a moment, which I think is coming up. Now, in this example, I'm going to show you how to author a percent of total calculation, and then I'm going to show you and compare and contrast that against the quick calcs. So if you're working in Power BI Desktop specifically, they've added this new feature called quick calcs, and it's a really good feature and really cool feature, but there is one kind of downside to that, and I want to show you the difference because a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, if, 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 if the Microsoft team keeps adding in all these quick calcs and these quick measures, why do I need to learn DAX? And I'm going to show you one of the, the caveats to using those quick calcs compared to kind of building out your own expression using the DAX expression language. All right, so we're going to go over here and let me bring in module two. And once again, I have a very simple example here. And what we have here is I've taken total sales and I've brought it into a matrix. And so on the rows, we have our different countries. We have United States, we have Australia, we have United Kingdom, so on and so forth. And what I want to do is we want to create a percent of total. So I want to know United States, what is their total sales percent of all countries? What is Australia's total percent to all countries? So what we need to do do here is essentially I need to divide the United States by the total sales for all countries and that means that I need to be able to get the total sales for all countries and put that really on the same row with the United States and with Australia so on and so forth but the problem with this is if we just got done talking about filter context is any measure that I bring into this table here is immediately going to be filtered down to the country meaning that if I bring total sales in again what happens is, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to bring in total sales again. If I bring in total sales again and I add that to my table, it automatically gets filtered down. So if I were to divide total sales by total sales, it's 100%, and that's not what we're looking for. This second value for total sales, I need it to essentially ignore the filter that has been applied inside of this table. So we need to ignore the default behavior of filter context. So some of you, most of you, have probably already done something similar to this at some point or another when you've written your DAX calculations. So I'm going to create a new calculation real quick, and we're going to call this our percent of total. Let me go ahead and get, you know what, I'm going to leave that in there because we'll convert that later. So I'm going to create a new measure here, and then I'm going to call this my percent of total measure. All right. And then inside of this, we know that we want to divide the total sales measure that we've already created. So I'm going to create a divide function. Let me zoom in on that. And I'm going to did not divide the numerator here. The numerator is the total sales calculation that we already have. The denominator needs to be the total sales, but it needs to ignore the filter that's been applied by this table. So that's like an implicit filter that happens automatically. And we can do that by using the calculate function. So remember that the calculate function accepts the very first parameter, which is a uh, an aggregate, right? And this aggregate here is just our total sales. And I want to override the filter context of this, this total sales, and I want to ignore the filter that's been put on the countries. And this is where that all function comes into place. So I type in all, and all, if you read the description here, it's the exact same description I showed you in the PowerPoint. It says it returns all the rows in a table or all the values in a column, ignoring the filter context. So on each one of these rows, they're being filtered down to whatever the current country is, and I want to ignore that. So I'm going to ignore that on the entire, the entire column. So I'm going to go to geography here, I'm going to bring in my country column, and then I'm going to close that up. I'll hit close again, and now what we've done is we said, hey, we want to divide total sales, which is my first total sales, which is respecting the current filter, and I'm going to divide that by total sales, which ignores the filter, which means essentially what it's doing is bringing in that 29 million so it can do the division. For my formatting here, I'm going to change that over to percentage, and then let's go ahead and hit enter, and then now I'm going to add that into our table real quick. So let me go over here and find percent of total calculation, and then I'm going to add that into my table. And then if we zoom back in, you'll see that the division is working correctly, and the reason for that is because that second measure in 
important side of that calculation is ignoring the filter context. Real quick, I could create a second measure here. Let me try that again, just so you can actually see what it's doing. Let's call this one total sales, all countries. And then I'm gonna do that calculate again. We're gonna do total sales, which is a measure that already exists. And then we're gonna say, you know what, ignore exact same thing we did before, except we're just not adding this to a division here. There we go. And then let's go ahead and give this one a percentage. Hit enter there, and then let's go ahead and bring that in. So what do we call this one? Total sales, all countries. Let's drag that in real quick. Well, I guess that wasn't a percentage. Sorry about that. That should have been a currency. But you can see that what it's doing is it's bringing in the entire value, which is essentially ignoring the filter. And once I have that, I can now take the numerator, divide that by the denominator, and that gives us our percentage. All right. So I'm going to get rid of total sales by all countries. I wanted to compare and contrast this to a new feature that was released in Power BI Desktop a couple months ago, which is called Quick Calcs. So if I go to my existing total cells, one of these total cells calculations that I brought in here, I can click on the drop down, and then you'll see we have show value as, and this is a quick calc, well, they used to be called quick calc, they actually renamed it. Now it's just called show value as, and I could come here and say, I wanna show this as a percent of grand total. If I do that, and then we zoom back in, you'll say, wow, that was super easy. It's done, why do I have to waste DAX to do any of uh, this, right? Why do I need DAX if, if there's obviously a shortcut to this? Well, one, you might be using tabular model, not Power BI Desktop. Two, this doesn't quite work the way you would expect it to. For example, let's say I was to somehow filter down the countries that show up in this list, where I only saw the countries for maybe the North America region or uh, Europe or something along those lines. Well, let's do something else. Let's go ahead and filter this down to the top five cells. So what we can do here, this is another feature, is I'm gonna go all the way down to my visual level filters here. And this is extra, this is not part of this webinar here. I'm gonna go into my visual level filters. I'm gonna say I wanna change the filtering to top n. This is a very quick and easy way to just show the top five products, top 10, top three. We're gonna do this by country. So show me my top three countries. And then I'm gonna do total countries. I'm gonna do it, order it by value. So the value is gonna to be total sales and then I'm going to apply my filter. So all I did is go to visual filters, expand the country, say I wanna see the top in number, and we're filtering that down to the top three by total sales and click apply filter. What's interesting about this is when I apply that filter, it actually is not quite correct anymore for the United States, Australia, and United Kingdom when you look at the quick calculation that was created by Power BI, by Power BI Desktop. And the reason for that is because it's only doing the percent of grand total based on the countries that exist inside of the report. Whereas our calculation that we created, we ignored all filters that were put on the country. So even though those other countries are no longer showing up in the report, our calculation overrides that and it still goes into the background and brings those, those countries in to the overall calculation. I'm not saying that one of these is bad and one of these is good. It really depends on what you're trying to do. But what I am saying is that when you author your own DAX calculations, you have a little bit more control over what's going on there and I could change this to work either way by building out my own DAX calculations. All right, so that's the percent of total. Now we're gonna get into really a more complex kind of conversation here, and this one's always a little bit more difficult for people to grasp and understand. And in this example here, we're gonna talk about working with multiple dates. All right, working with multiple dates. So in my date table, I have a single date table, and I have a date in that date table. And the example I'm gonna show you here is I've been doing some work with MLS data for a realtor that I've been working with, and I'm currently looking for a house, and I wanted to do some Power BI on that, right? So I got some data, and I've built a relationship between my, my date table to my MLS data table. And I built that date, I built that relationship on the sold date, which is very important. However, my MLS data has multiple date columns. It has a sold date, it has a listing date, and it has a contract date. And most fact tables have multiple dates. And this is more of a, a larger topic called role-playing dimensions, where date tables can play multiple roles. I don't want to talk about that because it can cause some kind of lines of confusion here in a very short webinar. But what I want to do is I want to be able to, to get a couple different measures. I want a measure that shows me my quantity sold, but I also want a measure that shows me my quantity of houses that were listed during that same period of time. That can be very, very difficult to understand. So I'm going to walk you through how you can set this up inside of DAX. All right. But note that when you build a relationship in, in, in DAX, inside of either Tabular or Power BI, you can only have one active relationship between two tables. 
and all of your filtering that goes on, the filter context automatically uses that active relationship, all right? In this example, we're also going to use the filter function. The filter function is also a, a, an advanced function that has a lot of application, a lot, a lot of purposes, and you're also going to use this filter function a lot as you start to build more and more advanced DAX calculations. The filter function is an iterator, just like any of your X functions, if you've ever worked with min, min X or max X or average X or rank X, any of those X functions, those, they're all iterators. You can typically tell an iterator because an iterator always accepts as its first parameter here. It always accepts a table or a table expression as the first parameter. And that table or table expression is what the iterator iterates over. So the way that these iterator functions work is they iterate over a table processing each row in that table uh, one at a time. So it's a row by row operation. And just to quickly speak to that, I'm just going to warn you to be careful with doing too many iterator functions and especially nesting those and getting too deep in your, your iterator functions because it can cause performance issues because it is a row by row operation. Typically, you're not going to see any performance kind of degradation from doing them as long as you keep it simple, but just be aware that you can run into some performance problems with that. And then once you get your table, your table expression, then you simply add a filter expression to that. This is a filter that table down to this specific result set, and then what filter returns is filter returns a table expression. So most of the time when you use filter, you're always using filter inside of another expression that essentially um, where you're trying to just reduce the, the table, right? You're trying to reduce the table to fit your parameters, and then you can return a scalar expression from that. So very complex, but also very rewarding once you learn how to use filter. All right. So I like to see things visually, so let's go ahead and jump into our next demo here, which is going to be module 03. And this is hopefully going to be a cool example here. So what I have is I have a very simple table, and this table is showing my quantity sold by year. All right. So I have 1,839 total properties in my MLS data here that we're looking at, and I'm able to see my quantity sold by year. The quantity sold measure that we're looking at is a very simple measure. It's simply counting the rows of MLS data. And what count rows does is it says, okay, count all the rows that are visible in the current filter context. So you know that if you're looking at this row right here, the current filter context is the year 2012. This is the, the, the confusion though, right? We're talking about the year 2012. Where this gets confusing is, well, why can't I bring in my listing date into a count of rows on the listing date? to get the number of properties that were listed during that period. So for example, let's say I go to my MLS data over here, and I'm just going to search for listing date real quick. I'm going to grab listing date and drag that into my values, and then I'm going to just do a quick kind of count. I'm not even going to create a measure on this. I'm just going to count the rows real quick, all right? So make sure I got the right one. I didn't. I'm doing a count, but notice that when I bring in the listing date column, which obviously the listing date is different than the, the sold date, Unfortunately, it's giving me the exact same results of the properties that sold. And once again, this can be extremely confusing. So what's going on here is it's all it's doing, all the count rows is doing is it's actually just counting the number of rows that are available in the filter context. And the filter context, unfortunately, is always filtered down to the sold date. The way I know that it's always filtered down to the sold date is because of the relationship that exists between the date table and the MLS data table. So if I go over to my relationships table and I look at my date table here, you'll see that the active relationship, it's the one with the solid line here, the active relationship is created on the date column to the sold date in my MLS data. And what this means is that anytime there's a filter that's added to the date table, like the year for example, the year propagates through this filter and it filters down the MLS data table. So if you were to pass in 2011, for example, it would filter down the MLS data table to only show the records that exist where a property sold in the year 2011. So when I do a count row on that table, I only get a count of the properties that sold in 2011. What I'm trying to do is I want to get a calculation of how many were actually listed in 2011, not sold in 2011, which means I need to use a different relationship, which is kind of tricky. To visualize this just a little bit further, what we can do is we can go over here to, let's go back over to our data tab. I'm going to go over to modeling and I'm going to filter down the existing table here just to give you a visual of what's going on. All right, so I'm gonna filter down the existing table. So I'm gonna say new table, and then let's call this MLS data. 
I'm going to give this a name, 2016. And then we're going to use that filter function I just told you about. The table that we want to filter down is MLS data. And then the expression I want to use is I just want to, let's see here. Excuse me. I want to do MLS data, and then we want to use the order date year, right? Or not order date, I'm sorry, the sold date. So I'm going to return the year from the sold date, and I want to say, all right, return only the records where it's sold for 2016, and then we're going to hit enter. When I do that, it's going to create a new calculated table where we're essentially taking the original table and we're filtering it down. By the way, using filter in calculated tables is a great way of being able to kind of debug your code and see what's going on with your filter expressions, something I use quite frequently. But if I come over here to the right and I start scrolling down, you'll notice that it says that this new table that I just created has 483 records, right? 483 records. If we go back to our report, you can see that for 2016, it says that we have 483 records. This filter over here on the left-hand side is doing the exact same thing that I just did with that filter expression and the, the, the calculated table. It's filtering down that result set for that row of data that you see, and then it's just simply counting up the rows. And what I want to do is I want to be able to override that filter context, and I want to be able to get a count of rows on, on the listing date. And unfortunately, this is not going to happen unless we build out some complex DAX. Now, there's a couple different ways to do this. I'm going to show you the typical way of doing it. There's another way you can do this just using a filter function and the all function together where you're not creating this relationship that I'm about to create. But what I would do is I would come in here first, and between my date table to my MLS date table, I would create a relationship between date to, to listing date, which is already created. And all you do is simply grab the date, drag that over to the other table, and build that relationship. All right, so we've already created that. Now what I want to do is I want to override the quantity sold measure that we created, and I want to say, hey, instead of using the relationship between date and sold date, I want you to use the relationship between date and listing date. So we want to override that filter context. The current filter context is on the sold date. I want to override that to the listing date. I said order date, I think. I'm used to working with adventure work, so I apologize for that. All right, so let's go. We've got a relationship created. So I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to go back up to my calculations table. And what I want to do is let's go ahead and create a new measure. So I'm going to create a new measure up here at the top, and then I'm going to call this quantity list. And then how we're going to do this is we're going to use the calculate function here. And then I'm going to say, all right, we have a, we have a measure already. That, me that measure is quantity sold. Remember that we said the first parameter of calculate is always an expression, which is going to be an aggregation, right? We already have a measure, so I want to reuse it. This measure by default uses the active relationship. And I want to tell it, don't use the active relationship. Use the relationship I tell you to use. And there is a function in DAX called use relationship. And I'm going to use the relationship between between my date table and the date column, and then I want to use, now this does not work unless you've built that inactive relationship. You can't just come in here and say use a relationship between two tables, it doesn't exist. So you have to build that inactive relationship in the relationships tab like I just did. And then I want to bring in the date from my MLS data table, and we're going to bring in the listing date. All right, so now I'll bring in and say I want to use that relationship, and then if we wanted to format that, we could come up here and make that a whole number. And then let's go ahead and hit enter. All right, so very simple here. I'm using calculate to say don't use the existing relationship, use the inactive relationship. And now, let's go ahead and zoom back out real quick. I'm going to find that calculation that we just created, and let's add that to our table. So that is called, let's see, quantity listed. I must have added it to the wrong table. There we go. Let's see, where is that at? All right, I'm going to look for it quantity list that I put on my date table. By the way, if you create measures like I do all the time and put them in the wrong table, you can change the table that they're in. So I'm going to change it from a home table of date. Let's move that back over to my calculations table I've created and put that in the right table. And now I'm going to bring in that quantity listed and I'm going to drop that into this table here. All right. And now when I zoom in, you'll see that we had about 103 that were listed in 2011 that apparently didn't sell in 2011. And you can see that the quantity listed here is different from the quantity that was sold. And this is really cool because now I can start doing, and this is some MLS data. I have a lot of really complex examples I use in this that shows a lot of awesome information about houses that sell and houses that get purchased.
purchased and list price versus actual sale price and square footage and everything. But this, the reason I wanted to create this calculation is so I could actually look at how many homes are being listed, how many are already on the market, so I can see is the market saturated and how does that affect actual sale prices. And in order to bring in how many houses are on the market and how many have been listed, I had to do this type of calculation, which essentially overrides that filter. So I can look at them on the same row and say, okay, in 2016, for the entire year, I see that only 343 homes were listed in that area and 483 sold. And what that tells me is that demand is up, supply is down. So very simple calculation in there. All right, so I have way less time than I thought I was gonna have. So let's jump into PowerPoint crashed on me. That's not good. Let me open that back up real quick. I think that's the first time PowerPoint's crashed on me. Let's see where we were there. Nope, that's the wrong one. That is the advanced DAX course. Hold on one second. Presentations. I have way too many presentations here. Advanced DAX, advanced DAX. All right. Oh, there weren't any slides left. All right, so the next example I want to show you guys then is total homes on market. All right, so we're not too far off, to, off, off topic here. What I will do is I haven't mentioned this yet. You guys, I'm sure, have been on multiple webinars in the past. The webinars will be recorded, and what I'll do is I always run out of time because I try to fit too much into the webinar. Um, so the webinar is recorded. You can go back and watch it. If you have questions, email me, but also I'll go through every single one of the questions that came through the chat, and I will post those questions to my blog, and also Pragmatic Works will post it as a follow-up and send you an email once that's done. So you will get the question answered eventually, but I just won't get to it probably during this webinar. But it looks like we might have a couple minutes at the very end here to actually look at uh, some of that information. What I want to do now, though, is I want to look at, we have our quantity sold, right? We have our quantity listed. I now want to create a new measure real quick, and that new measure is going to show me my total number of homes that are on the market at any given point, at any given time. So the way we're going to do that is using the filter function and using the all function in conjunction together. So let's create a new measure. Make sure I select the right table this time. I'm going to create a new measure here. And I'm going to call this one total homes on market. All right, and then I'm going to do that count rows. And then the rows that I want to count is the count rows function expects a table, a table or an expression as a single parameter. And we're going to remember I said the filter function returns a table expression that can be used inside of other expressions. That's typically how you're going to use the filter function. So now I'm going to pass in the filter function here. And the filter function works over a table itself, and it's going to return data from the MLS data table. Now I'm purposely making a mistake here or making an error, and I'll show you what that means in just a moment. So we want to use the all function, but I'm not going to use it on purpose. And what I want to do is say, okay, when I'm counting the rows for 2011 and I'm counting the rows for 2012 and 13, I want to filter this down to only look at, so MLS data where the sold date is greater than or equal to the minimum date. All right, and let's kind of talk through what this is here. The first, there's gonna be two criteria. I want to count all the rows where the house has not sold yet, right? So if the sold date of a home is greater than the minimum date of the current context, then I want to count that record. So what does this mean? This is very confusing when you're not actually visualizing it. Remember that the filter context here is the current year, right? That's whatever's inside of the table. So it's the columns, the rows, the filters, and the slicers. And that's why I have us kind of visualizing this report right now. The minimum date for any one of these rows is going to be the minimum date for that year. Here. So the minimum date for 2011 is January 1st of 2011. So if the home sold after January 1st of 2011, then it was on the market during the year of 2011. Make sense? So what I'm doing here is I'm saying if the sold date of the current record that I'm looking at is greater than or equal to the minimum date of the filter context, which changes on each one of these different sales here, essentially, then it's a sold item. Now, that's not completely accurate, and the reason it's not completely accurate is because the listing date here, let's see if I can get that to pull up, the listing date must be less than or equal to 
the max date. All right, so let's walk through this again. By the way, if you don't pick this up, if you've never walked through using the calculate function or the filters, and you're not picking this up immediately, that's okay. It took me a lot of times of reading and going through you know, YouTube videos and any other thing I could find before I really understood this. So I don't expect everybody to pick this up the very first time you see this. What I'm doing here is I'm saying, all right, if the home sold after the minimum date, which if I'm looking at the third row here, the minimum date would be January 1st of 2013. If the home sold after January 1st, 13, and the home was listed before December 31st of 2013, because I'm returning the max from that current filter context, then it was on the market. It's a valid home that was on the market during that year. All right, so let's go ahead, and it's already a whole number. Let's hit enter here, and then I am going to minimize that, and let me go ahead and bring in total homes on market. So I'm going to add that to my table real quick, and let's take a look at that. All right, so how many total homes were on the market in... 2012, 256, 330, 337, so on and so forth. And that actually does not look correct. No, that's not correct. What did I do here? Count rows, filter. Oh, sorry, but I told y'all I was making an error on purpose. And then I forgot I was making an error on purpose. Yeah. So let me tell you why this doesn't, um, why it's not working. So what happened here is that that filter function is still respecting this filter of 2012. It still respects that filter. And because of that, it's returning the incorrect values here. So what we have to do is we have to do one more thing. So if I go into my total homes on market, expand this out. What we have to do is I have to say, hey, when you're filtering, when you're iterating over this table, remember the first expression, the first parameter of the filter function is a table or a table expression, right? When you're iterating over this table, right now it's actually filtered down to the filter context. And I want to remove all filters on that table. The way that we do that, if you remember, is we want to add in that all function. So I add in the all function there. It removes that filter context of 2011, 2012, 2013, which means now I can see the entire table so I'm removing the filter, and then I still respect that. See, this is what's interesting about this and, and what a lot of people don't get when they first start messing with this. I still respect that filter because I'm applying it here. I'm still looking at that date that's being applied. And I'm saying, hey, look at that filter. I'm just removing it from the MLS data here, but then I'm still using it down here inside of my kind of new filter that's being applied for our count rows, all right? So it's still being used here, but it's not there. Now if I hit enter, hopefully it works this time. I was a little bit scared a moment ago because I was like, that does not look right. And now you can see that the numbers are looking much, much better. So total homes on market in 2012 was 371, but only 256 homes sold. Total homes on market in 2013 was 409, 330 sold. And you can go down the list and kind of see how many were on the market and how many sold during that period. All right, so I think we have a couple minutes here. Um, Erica, I don't see the questions, but if you have any questions, either A, you can make me an organizer so I can see them, or you can just give me some of the questions that are out there. Okay. And I can try to answer um, a couple of them real quick. Let me go ahead and read some out to you. Um, okay. All right, um, speaking of multiple dates, is there a way to impl implement by temporal data set with DAX? I do not understand that question at all, Erica. So we have to move on real quick. I'm yep. assuming that was it, w when you were in the middle of a... Um, oh yeah, I know when it was, I just don't know what they mean by by temporal. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Um, can you do DAX calculation if you have semester and just year? For example, fall 2017, spring 2018, and compare current and past um, semester years. Absolutely. Yep. That will uh, happen automatically. So you can do that with months, quarters, semesters, and years. 
Weeks are going to be tricky because weeks are more, they don't really fall in specific months or quarters. They can, you get one week that shows up in one month and the next month or in multiple quarters or multiple years. But with semesters, absolutely. It, all you would do is, I don't think I actually have one in my data set here, but if I did, I would go down to my date, I would drag that in, it would automatically be part of that filter context just like the month. So there's nothing extra that you have to do there. Uh, that would happen automatically as long as it's part of your data set. Okay, um, here's another one for you. Um, George asks here, uh, I would like to ask if the quantity listed measure worked because the MLS table contained only sold items? Um, it does only contain sold items. That is a, an accurate observation. Even though I didn't mention it, it is only showing sold homes. Um, but it will work either way. So the reason that the quantity listed is actually adding up to the exact same number as the quantity sold is because we're looking at, you know, 2016, we're not looking at 2017 at all. And all of those homes that were listed ended up selling and we're only looking at sold data. But if we were looking at data for the, that was more current in this example, then the quantity listed would actually be higher than the quantity sold. So it would still work accurately, but the numbers would not per perfectly match up in the totals column. Okay, um, let's see what else here. Um, okay, is it better performance-wise or for ease of use, understanding, readability to create a measure than use it with then use it in a more complex DAX, or is it okay to nest everything? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons um, why I'm going to answer this the way I will, but we always say it's it's best to create the measure and then reuse it in everything else because it's, it's essentially going to make everything you do a little bit simpler. It's easier to go back and read it. So from a readability and a maintainability perspective, it's easier. So for example, let's say that I created a profit measure and I use that profit measure in my year-to-date profit, my, my, my prior year profit, my fiscal year profit, and maybe 20 other calculations. Well, if somebody comes to me two months from now and says, hey, we accidentally gave you the wrong logic to define profit, I only have to go to one place and change that profit, me profit measure. Whereas if I had just built that logic into every single one of those calculations, then I would have to go to every single one of those calculations and change it in multiple locations and hopefully I would find every one of those and get them all updated and get them all changed. So we always recommend um, using that explicit measure and then reusing it in your other calculations specifically for that reason. All right, um, and let's just do one more question here. Um, let's see, Joe asks, would you ever create a measure as a date for, for a comparison? A measure for a date. I don't, I might have to email Joe on that one. I don't understand that one. Okay. Uh, typic, typically, no. The only time I would ever create any kind of dynamic measure is if I was trying to look at current year or last three months or something like that, and it would determine the value, the range of dates to look at. But if I was doing like year over year or month over month, that's significantly easier than having to, uh, having to go and actually create a date using a measure. All right, um, and I will be sending you, uh, Mitch, all these questions if you ever do want to get back or uh, create a blog post based on these questions um, just to address, you know, things that people are um, asking about during these webinars. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up for you here. Thank you so much um, for presenting today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for today's webinar on Advanced DAX. We will be sending all registrants a follow-up email with a link to the full recording of the webinar tomorrow. Um, so please feel free to browse our free training offerings on the Pragmatic Works website and join us every Tuesday for free training. Thanks again, guys. Thank you.